Have you noticed that this mic pops once in a while? Have you ever noticed that? Have you noticed how many popular courtroom TV shows that are on TV? It started out, I think, uh, I, I want to say Judge Wapner, the People's Court, might have been the first one. Then after that came Judge Judy, right? And then there was one, uh, Judge Mills Lane. He was a professional boxer uh, and then a boxing referee. He turned into a judge. Now it seems like there's all kinds of shows on about uh, judges and courtrooms. And I, I wonder if the popularity of these types of shows doesn't have something to do with the fact that People dream about being judges themselves, right? Wouldn't it be nice to sit on the bench and just kind of pass judgment on people and judge between people's complaints? Uh, I think we all find ourselves thinking about that sometimes because I think the truth is every one of us likes to judge others. No, we're not elected. We're self-appointed judges. We place ourselves on the bench and pass judgment on our family members, on our friends, on our co-workers, on our church members. We observe the lives of our neighbors or fellow Christians and make judgments about them. In our scripture today, we find James telling us two things. Actually, says more than that, but there's two I want us to look at today. The first is that we are to be humble. This is a continuation of last week. Uh, and second is, in our humility, we are not to judge others. So again, James is continuing his theme from humility. We talked about that uh, earlier in the chapter. James quoted Proverbs chapter 3, verses 34, and reminds us that God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Then he goes on to tell us that if we humble ourselves, instead of lifting ourselves up and trying to make ourselves important, if we will humble ourselves before God, God himself will lift us up. Now he continues with this thought. He says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Now, this is a continuation of what he said back in chapter 3. Uh, James is chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. He says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Well, James continues here in that line. He says, anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. Now, by the law, he could be referring to what we know as the Old Testament law. Because there was a command in Leviticus, uh, chapter 19, verse 16, which basically prohibits slandering one another. Uh, he could be... Uh, quoting that, but I don't think that that is the law he's talking about. In fact, he tells us that he's talking about God himself. Verse 12, he says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your, <clears throat> your neighbor? Excuse me. In other words, do you really think you can speak against and judge God's law? You think you know everything? You think you're really wise and, and smart enough that you can judge what God has put in place? James says, even if you think you can, the answer is no. No, you can't, and you aren't. He says there is only one lawgiver and judge, and guess what? It isn't you. Who is it then? Well, it's the one who's able to both save and destroy. And then James kind of needles him a little bit. I, I don't know about you, but I like James. He's kind of fun, you know, he's, he's boisterous. I picture him as this like real character, you know. And he says, uh, he needles them, he, he's almost mocking them. He says, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? And then he continues to expand on earlier themes, and here he does it again about judging. Uh, earlier in chapter 2, James told us that when we, discriminate, when we discriminate against others in the church, we're doing it from a place of judgment. If we show favoritism, we're discriminating and, and actually judging them when we do that. In James 2.4, he says, Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And then he continues, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Forever, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but 
do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Therefore, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. So here, James is telling us that slander, when we're slandering others, it comes from passing judgment on them. And the judgment comes from our pride. James and Jesus both tell us that as Christians, there's no place for that type of pride in our relationships with others. There's no place for that type of pride in our life, the type of pride that causes us to judge and look down on others. Instead, we should be humble. Now, pride in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with having you know, pride in your children's accomplishments, pride in your grandkids, right? There's no sense in having, there's nothing wrong with having pride in your church or feeling good about something. But that's not the kind of pride that James is talking about. James continues to help us uh, understand his point about being humble. He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. So James is giving them and us a little dose of humility here. He gives us a word picture to remind us of how insignificant our lives really are. Now, your life is important. Jesus tells us that even the hairs on your head are numbered. So you are important. And yet, if you think that you are important yourself, if you want to boast and slander others and your pride is getting in the way, James tells us, look, you're, you're like a mist. It's like uh, if you came to church earlier this morning, or I don't know how long it lasted out there, but there was this big fog everywhere. And by now, I'm sure when we go home, it'll be gone. Well, James says, this is what your life is like. That is what it's like. And the mature Christian understands this. This is part of having wisdom and living out humility. So James is giving us a similar image that he gave us earlier in chapter 1 about our life and our significance, if you think you're all that. right? Remember in chapter 1, he's talking to the rich, and he says, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while he goes about his business. But James is telling us that it's not just the rich who better keep their life and their importance in perspective, that it's all of us. All of our lives are short and fading. And we don't have any control over that. That is why we should not boast about our lives, but instead say, if the Lord wills. He says, verse 15, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and we will do this or that. Now, it would be annoying to say that every single time, right? Well, we're going out to lunch after church, if the Lord wills. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, I'm going to see my mom, if the Lord wills, right? That would be annoying to us. In fact, if someone did that all the time, we would think they were like over-spiritual or something like that. They'd be an annoying person to be around. So I don't think James is telling you that you have to say that. I think instead his point is clear, is that our attitude, our, our thoughts should not be boastful. Instead, we should be humble. We should have the fear of the Lord. We've talked about that for a couple weeks now. The fear of the Lord is understanding and acknowledging who God is and who we are in relation to him. So James is speaking about the arrogance of the heart. He says, verse 16, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. First, he was talking about the desires that are at war within us, right? Those, he calls those desires evil. Now he's saying your arrogance, that is evil as well. So is boasting. Arrogance that causes us to judge others and to slander them. Then he says this, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. If anyone knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now this is, this might be the most important thing you hear me say this morning, other than the announcement about the men's pies, right, for Thanksgiving, that was probably the most important, right? But this could be the second most important thing. Is God calling you to do good, but you don't do it? 
You feel God prompting you and nudging you? Now, all of us who have a heart, sometimes are, you know, we feel compassion and pity on, on people and we want to help them. Doesn't mean that that's always someone God's put in our path, right? There's not always that time. But what James is trying to say, his point is this, is that when you're so puffed up with pride, when you're so arrogant and you're looking down on people and judging them, especially those people that might need help, that pride, that arrogance is going to be able to, is going to get in the way of you being able to hear God leading you or prompting you. And, and he's, he's saying more than that. He's, he's saying, oh, you, you think you're so smart? You think you're so great? You're going to judge others? You're going to sit in judgment even over God's laws? Okay, well then why don't you recognize what he's calling you to do and why aren't you doing it if you're so smart, if you're so great? And we can hear James repeating his brother Jesus' words here. The King James Version says it very concisely, I like it, judge not lest ye be judged, right? The full of that we read earlier, uh, Matthew chapter 7, um, judge not or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. So, you, you know, many sins, and I'm not preaching through the Sermon on the Mount, but we're, we're talking about judging others, uh, and slandering them as we judge them, but... Many sins that we tend to judge others for really aren't actual sins as defined by the Bible at all. A lot of times they're, they're just cultural or societal or generational things, right, that aren't really sins at all. How often have you heard an older person say to a younger person, take your hat off when you're in the church. Don't wear a baseball cap in the church. What's wrong with you? And they're judging them. Now, I get it. It's a sign of respect. I totally understand that. I'm happy for you not to have your hats on in here. And yet, my point is, we tend to then judge those people. We look down on them. How about someone that smokes? A lot of people judge people that smoke. So look at that. I'm not advocating smoking. It's not healthy for you. You might get cancer if you do. I'm talking about where's our hearts at as we look at other people and start to judge them, right? This kind of judging divides us and does not bring unity. And when Jesus said, judge not, uh, was he wanting his disciples to close his eyes to all types of evil and error in the world? No, of course not. Did he intend that managers forego critical performance evaluations of their employees? Well, you shouldn't judge them. No, of course that's not what he's talking about. Or that juries should refrain from passing judgment uh, on a criminal because after all, you know, we're all, we're, none of us are perfect. No, of course that's not what he's talking about. Should we decline to make any assessment of others completely since none of us are perfect? Some people are under the impression that the Lord forbids us uh, the use of our power uh, of thinking and critical thinking to make any judgments of all. But Scripture does not teach that, nor did Jesus actually teach that. Yes, we just heard him say, judge not lest you be judged. And yet, at the same time, in John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus said, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Oh, Jesus is calling us to use our brains. Jesus is calling us to make some assessments, to look at some character, to listen to words people are saying, to see what their actions are. We are called to make some judgments, but Jesus says make right judgments. Don't judge someone on appearance based on the way they look because they talk different than you, they dress different than you, maybe they have some hobbies that are different than yours. Referring to church discipline, the Apostle Paul said to judge those who are inside the church, inside your local church, rather than outsiders. We see this all the time, and I get it. People that aren't even in the church, people that aren't even Christians, they don't even say or pretend to be Christians. And yet we look at them and try to expect them to follow Jesus' teachings and Christians' teachings. Now, of course we wish that we would, they would, right? The world would be a nicer place if they did. But if someone doesn't claim to be a Christian, even if they're from some other religion, why would we expect them 
to follow biblical teaching? Why would we expect them to live their life, to treat us or others the way that Christ calls us to treat? We want it. That doesn't make sense. And yet we do. We do. The Apostle John taught the people to test the spirits in 1 John 4, uh, which requires making a judgment, judging between right and wrong. If you're testing uh, someone's spirit, if you're testing something that a teacher is teaching you, you have to have something that you're basing that judgment on, right? Jesus also tells us in Matthew chapter 7, later on, he says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, be discerning. We need to be discerning. What we don't need to be, and what Jesus and James are speaking against, is the kind of hypocritical, judgmental attitude that just tears others down in order to build ourselves up. It comes from a place of pride, where we look at ourselves and then we look down at others and slander them and judge them. These are not meant to be blanket statements against all type of uh, critical thinking, right? A very critical, negative barber who never had a good thing to say about anyone was cutting a a salesman's hair one day. And while they was there, they were making small talk and the salesman said, I'm going to Rome next week on a trip. And the barber said, oh, what airline are you taking and what hotel are you staying in? Well, after the salesman told him, the barber said, that airline is terrible. You get terrible service there. And that hotel is lousy. You probably get bed bugs. You're not going to enjoy that. And and he says, well, what what are you doing while you're there? He said, well, I I actually have this big uh, sale I'm trying to make. And then actually I've got an appointment. I'm going to see the Pope. And the salesman said, don't expect to see the Pope. He only sees important people. Well, salesman went and a few weeks later he came back in to get another haircut and the and the barber said oh how, how was your trip to rome and he said oh it was great the airline was great the flight over was super and the hotel was great i had great service it was just a great trip all together and the barber said well did you get to see the pope and he said oh yeah i did in fact i got to kiss his ring And the barber impressed said, oh, wow, what happened? He said, well, I I was leaning over and I kissed his ring. And the barber said, well, then what happened? What did the Pope say? He said, well, he he went to place his hands on my head to bless me. And he said, where did you get this lousy haircut? (laughs) When you judge others, it will usually come back to you. That's so true, isn't it? Most of us are in such a habit of judging and criticizing others that we don't think about how it affects them. It just easily rolls off the tongue. And for us, it's just something we don't think about. But sometimes that slander, those criticisms, they hurt. And sometimes they stay with people for a long, long time. As we look forward to receiving communion this morning, I would encourage you to examine your own hearts. And if there's something that needs to be repented of, today would be a good time to do that. Please pray with me. Father, we don't want to judge others. We don't want to criticize them. But it's so hard to keep our thoughts in check, let alone our tongues and our words. Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you please work in our hearts? Help us to become more like your son, Jesus. Help us to put away our foolish pride, which is worth nothing. Help us to guard our tongues before we speak. Help us to speak words of grace and love that bring unity. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.